2 Corinthians, uh, as we dig in tonight, just uh, uh, this first chapter, uh, as Paul writes to the church at Corinth again, uh, probably written from Philippi, uh, uh, soon after he had written the other letter, there was dissension, there was trouble with the legalists that had come in and uh, uh, really were bashing Paul and he was defending himself and really this letter is more of a personal letter than any of the others uh, that he has written uh, in in the New Testament. Uh, but as he goes through this, he, he certainly brings out much doctrine, much truth uh, that we need to look at, uh, especially for our own hearts. Uh, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are in Achaia. Uh, an apostle, uh, as he calls himself here, uh, not because he chose it, but because the will of God chose it for him. Uh, he had ordained that Paul would be an apostle, ordained Paul to be that apostle that he would have, uh, and ministered to him in the midst. And, and we think uh, of former President Trump and all that he's gone through and all the bashing and all the things that he's gone through, and yet we look at Paul and we see all of the stuff that came against him, and yet he persevered, uh, and certainly not in his own strength, but in the strength of God that was for him because he had a mission for him. He had a, 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 a time for him to be in the church, to be ministering, uh, and everything was breaking loose against him. Everywhere he went, there was a riot. They stoned him once, dragged him out of the city dead, threw him down and left him, uh, and, and the Lord revived him and brought him back and ministered to him and ministered through him. Uh, and we see the same kind of spirit here uh, in Paul uh, that uh, we should look for for ourselves. Lord, help me to be faithful. Help me to be persevering. And no matter what the world says, help me to keep going. And the world is definitely against Christianity right now. Uh, but don't worry, you're not alone. <laughs> because if God is for you, who can be against you? Uh, so just keep plugging away. Keep going. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it was by the will of God. And whatever we do, it should be by the will of God. Uh, and, and you really need to be praying in everything that we do. Uh, he tells us in Colossians to pray without ceasing, to be in prayer constantly, with, and bring all that, that supplication with thanksgiving, to be praying, to be persevering in it, but to be asking God's will for our life. We all don't have to be ministers because we are all ministers of the gospel no matter where we are, uh, some more in the forefront than others. Paul certainly was in the forefront all through Asia, uh, all with the rest of the uh, apostles, uh, but in that place of being seen, but uh, we should all have that heart. Uh, Lord, what is your will for my life? What do you have for me right now? And for some of us, we know we have these physical limitations. We, we have age limitations. <laughs> we can't do what we used to do, and that's all right, because God still is, is using us to minister his love to those that are around us. We're, we're not just here in this world to enjoy the things that are here. We're here for God's purposes, and we're here for God's plan. And we're not here just to have a good life for ourselves and then die and go to heaven. We're, we're here for God's glory. So, Lord, help us no matter where we are to show your love. Uh, so he says, I'm, I'm an apostle by the will of God. In this letter, I'm going to write to the church, which is, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all of Achaia, so all of Asia. So the letter is going to go from church to church. The letter is, is uh, for those that are out there. And saints aren't saints that we think of in uh, this time in, of life where the saints are uh, just voted in by the church. <laughs> saints are saints because God is in them. Jesus Christ has saved them. And as soon as you're saved, you're a saint. So the next time you, you go to the courthouse, you can just, and they ask you your name, you can do, just tell them, hey, I'm Saint so-and-so, <laughs> because you are. You're a saint. You're sanctified, and all it means is that you're set apart. You're set apart for God's use. You're not set apart 
for your own use. You're not set apart for your own pleasure. You're set apart for his glory. So, Lord, show me where it is and in how it is that you would have me to go. Uh, and he says in verse 2, uh, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, grace and peace which he uses in all his letters except for the pastoral epistles when he uses grace, mercy, and peace, but grace and peace. And and you really have to notice the order uh, because you can't have peace without knowing grace first. You need to know the grace of God before you can know the peace of God. And so know the grace of God so so that peace will come. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the Father from whom all mercies flow. Uh, we sing it. We, we've had it in some of our creeds and some of our previous churches. Uh, the Father of mercies. He's the Father of mercy. And a, a good father gives out those mercies to his children. And, and God certainly has given us mercy and grace in the times that we're in, the seasons that we're in. Uh, the ways of our life that were against him, and yet he still poured out mercy and grace to you and I to bring us to salvation. And he's the father of mercies. He's the originator. He's the one that brings it. He's the one that passes it out. He's the one that ordains it to be so that we could have it. It certainly doesn't come from Satan. It certainly doesn't come from one who is a destroyer and a liar. There is no mercy in that. There's only destruction But our God pours out mercy. So we have grace, peace, and mercy. We have God the Father, God the Son, and we're going to see God the Spirit. And just in these first few verses, we're going to see the Trinity at work in Paul's life. And as Paul brings that to the church, we're going to see him give the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit to the church. And say, church, wake up and see what the Father's doing, what the Son is doing, what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That word comfort is pericleus, uh, which is where we get the word periclete from, which is the Holy Spirit, one who comes alongside with comfort. The Holy Spirit comes alongside with comfort, not with a rod to beat you, but one who comes alongside of you with comfort to lead you and to guide you in the right ways. And as he ministers to the church, and remember the church is a mess, but Paul writing these letters, just teaching and giving out doctrine, giving out understanding for people's hearts, that hearts would be changed. Uh, Leaving Timothy, leaving Titus, bringing these, these men through these churches so that they could see that, that the same heart is with the, the brothers who are there teaching by the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives because of the salvation of Jesus Christ, whom God the Father has sent. And we see the whole Trinity at work in the church. And we see the whole Trinity at work in our lives. The Father who created us, Jesus who died for us, the Holy Spirit who comes, who shows us Jesus Christ to lead us and to guide us into all truth, Scripture says. Notice not into lies, but into all truth. He's the one that guides us in those ways. And he says, blessed be God. Is Paul just breaks out in in praise and worship. Uh, Just blessed be the Lord. Blessed be God, the Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. And he goes on and he says, "Who who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And do something with those words, us and all. Short words, but they're important. All of us in all things. He wants to bring that comfort in all our tribulations. It tells us in Scripture that we're going to have trials and tribulations in this world. We're going to have hard times. We're going to have hard seasons. Uh, Whether personally or nationally, we're going to have hard seasons. And we see those all around And we see it more and more in the world as every nation is pretty much falling apart, not knowing what to do, not knowing what direction, afraid to make a move, not a real good leader in any nation right now. The world is waiting for one. We already have one. (laughs) His name is Jesus. He's already on the throne. He's in heaven. But he comforts us. And notice that ETH, if you have the King James, 
that comforteth us in all our tribulations. That means he comforts us and continues to comfort us. It's not past tense, it's present, and it's continuous. It continues on and on in all your tribulations. The tribulations that you face today, the tribulations that you're going to face tomorrow, he's there to bring comfort in those. And Lord, what what is that comfort? What does that comfort look like? And, and he's going to tell us that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we comfort our wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Uh, the comfort is available as Paul brings it forth. That comfort is available in every situation. It's just that we don't always choose to have that comfort in our lives. Lord, this situation is too hard for my life. It's too hard for my heart. And he says, I, I have this comfort. All you have to do is receive it. Because if he's given us everything that we need for life and godliness, if he's given us all the comfort that we need to have, the only reason we don't have it and the only reason we, we haven't accessed it is because we really don't know about it and we really don't want it. We think that God is, is abandoned us and given up on us. When he hasn't, he offers it, but we have to receive it. And then not only receive it, but believe it and trust it. And if you can't believe it and trust it, that God has comfort for you, we know that he says he already gives it. So then we just ask him and we just thank him for it and continue to thank him for it until it becomes a reality in our lives. Lord, these hardships I have in my life, I can't deal with them anymore. Yes, you can, because he's already given you the comfort to do it. And isn't that one of the cries in our nation right now with the suicide rate doubling in many age groups uh, in the United States and all over the world is that they have no hope because they have no comfort. They have no peace. And he says grace and peace and mercy and comfort. That's what he wants for the church. And yet many in the church aren't receiving it because they, they don't believe that God is real in who he is. And this takes us to depths I think as Christians that we really need to go to, especially in the days that we're in and especially in the days that we're coming to, we're going to need to know God's comfort. Things could be so different if that bullet was a half an inch further over. The hope that we had for a revival in our nation might be gone because some of us are counting on politicians to bring us out of this. Politicians can't bring us out of anything. Only Jesus is going to get us out of this. And so we've got to trust him. But if your hope was in that and it was dashed, what would you hope in? Hmm. Was he your first choice or was Jesus? Jesus, you're my first choice for comfort. So help me to trust you. And I think the Lord is bringing the church to depths that we need to go to that we haven't been in a long time because many of the churches are so so much in the surface and so many of our walks are, are surface walks. They're not deep walks. And the Lord wants to take us deeper. And I think these days are going to bring that deep walk to us and for us. And we need to be encouragers for each other in that. Lord, help us. I was reading uh, Hannah Whitehall Smith, uh, one of her books. And, and uh, boy, uh, uh, she was just uh, complaining to one of her neighbor friends who was a Christian. Uh, about how bad things were and how, how she felt that God had abandoned her and things were overwhelming her. And, and the lady just looked at her and said, but God is still here. And that's all she said. And she got so mad at her. That's all you're going to tell me? <laughs> you're not going to take me anywhere else? But she had to learn but that God was enough. And it took that lady just saying that over and over every time she complained to her, but God is enough. To bring her to a place of just realizing I don't need anything else because God is going to be enough. So Lord, help me to believe that you are enough for my trials that are going on right now. That I can trust you no matter what goes on. Even if they don't go the way that I want them to, that you are enough and that you're going to keep me in this. He comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them. You see, the things that we get aren't to keep. The things that we get are to give to others. The comfort that we get from God is the comfort that he wants us to give to those that are around us. The good news that we have that God has given us isn't to keep, it's to give to those that are around us. 
Everything that we receive from the Lord is to be given out. Everything that Jesus had from the Father, he gave to his disciples. Everything the disciples had, they gave to the churches. Everything in the word is for us to give out to those that are around us. Because the world doesn't have this hope. They may have Bibles in their living room gathering dust, but they have no idea what's inside. And we're those witnesses that are to bring that out. He comforts us that we can give that comfort to those that are around us because God is already comforted. And notice that uh, it's past tense. He's already comforted us. Oh, the comfort is there. But Lord, I don't feel it. That doesn't mean it's not there. It just means we're not trusting God in it. Lord, help me to trust you more, to know that you have given me comfort. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, there's an encouraging statement, isn't it? <laughs> You're going to suffer. <laughs> as he is, he writes to the church, and boy, is he honest, isn't he? You're going to suffer, church, because if Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. Because Jesus even said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. And we're going to enter into the sufferings of Christ. And if we enter into those sufferings because we are Christians, because we are Christ ones, Disciple is just a word saying that we're Christ ones. We're ones of Christ that are learning to be like Christ. And, and he says, you're going, to bring, you're going to have sufferings that are going to come into your life. But notice he says that after he tells them that you have the comfort that you need to get through those sufferings. This world is not here to bring joy to us. This world is here to bring suffering. Ever since sin entered in, it's just been a time we've been born to die. We break down. If you don't believe it, you haven't looked in the mirror lately. <laughs> We're breaking down. We're not getting better. We're getting worse. I don't care how much money you, you spend at Walgreens and CVS and all those places. It isn't going to help you. You're going to break down. You can go for all the Botox you want. You can get all the treatments. You, you can get the facelifts. You can get the tummy tucks. You can get the arm tucks. You can get all those tucks. It isn't going to help you. You're still going to break down, but you'll br break down looking tight and firm and great, but you're still going to break down and go. It's just, Lord, help us as we enter into those sufferings. The sufferings of Christ are going to abound in us. We're, we're going to have those. Uh, and so often we're sitting here as whining Christians, and it just reminds me of Israel, especially because we're going through Exodus on Sunday mornings. What is the biggest thing that they do for 40 years? They whine. <laughs> and what's the biggest thing that Christians do? We whine. Because of the situations that we're in, because of the diseases that we have, because of the afflictions that come our way, and we whine about them instead of trusting the Lord with them. And it, it, it certainly isn't a rebuke. It's an exhortation. Let's get to that place where we know his comfort in the midst of those things so that we can help each other. It says the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so, so notice, so also our consolation also aboundeth, and there's that ETH again, it abounds and continues to abound, by what? By Christ. By Christ. That's where our consolation comes from, is Christ. That's where we go to when troubles come. That's where we go to when victories come. That's where we go to when discouragements come. That's where we go to when depression comes. Lord, help me to go to the consolation that only you can bring because you've been through this world. You've been through these times. You've taken upon yourself every sin known to man and you defeated it. Lord, you know how to get through. Lord, give me that consolation to know that you'll get me through. Oh. <coughs> he says, and whether we be afflicted it is for your consolation. <laughs> As Paul's sitting there, probably in Philippi, if he did write this letter from Philippi, he's in jail. <laughs> Whether we be afflicted like we were at Philippi, it's for your consolation. He looks at it and he says, I'm not in jail because I was bad. I'm not in jail because I did something wrong. I'm in jail because God has ordained for me to be here now, not only for the salvation of the jailer that's there, but for the church at Corinth to see that I can sing at midnight and raise my voice to the Lord and thank him for the comfort that he brings me even when I'm hurting, 
even when I've been beaten with stripes, when my sores are bad, when, it, when I'm being held up by chains, I can still sing praises to the Lord. Lord, help me to know your comfort there. And he says, this affliction that I have right now is just so that you can be encouraged. Oh. And we see groups all over the world, underground churches in China and Iran, that are growing like crazy, being persecuted awfully, and yet standing in the truth of who God is. And it's their affliction is for our encouragement that we can stand to in the things that we're going through. And the hardships that they have are hard, but they're different than our hardships. But they're all just as hard, aren't they? And who's the one that brings the comfort? Who's the one that brings the consolation? They come by Christ. And so stand in Christ tonight and walk in the truth of who he is. Uh, It says this in in Mark chapter 4, verse 38. It says, uh, that Jesus, well, there's a, a great storm that in, in Mark chapter 4, uh, and you know the story, they're, they're in a storm and the disciples are going crazy and they can't beat the storm. Jesus is asleep. It says he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind. And what did he say to him? Why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? He doesn't say little faith there. He says no faith. You have no faith that you can get through this. Where's your faith, disciples? Oh, and these are the men that are going to be the apostles. And we think, well, if I'm a Christian, I should have faith. And we get discouraged with ourselves because we don't have enough faith. You know what? The disciples didn't have enough faith. The apostles didn't have enough faith. The Lord looked at him and said, you have no faith. (laughs) <laughs> and we go, well, Lord, that, that's me right now. And he says, well, be encouraged because I grew them up in who I am. And now they have faith and they're walking in faith. And they're walking by faith now. The same as I want you to. Don't be discouraged and, and don't go and pout in a corner. Get up, quit yourself like men and, and get moving. Or in other in vernacular of now, suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get moving. <laughs> And he says this in, in, in Psalm 18, verse 7. Uh, Psalm 18. I hope it's Psalm 18. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I fooled myself and wrote down the wrong thing. Anyway, we'll just go on. I'll work on this as I go here. Uh, I dropped half my Bible out. It's not good. He says, but but our hope uh, of you is steadfast. Uh, As Paul looks at the church and and they're they're a mess and they're discouraged, they're struggling with what's going on. But Paul says, our hope of you is steadfast. Hope isn't based on what we see. Hope is based on what truth is. And Jesus is truth. And if Jesus has said that, that he has given us consolation and comfort, then he can get us through these times. And Paul says, our hope of you is steadfast because our hope isn't in what you are. Our hope is in what Jesus can do. And that's what our hope for each other is, is that we'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of who God is so that we can stand in the days that we're in. We can stand in the trials and the tribulations that come our way. And we can stand in those places where we can rejoice together when things are good. We can weep together when things are hard. But our faith doesn't waver because our faith is built on that solid rock of Jesus Christ. It's steadfast. It's unmovable. It's unchangeable. It's always in truth. And he, and he says that's where our hope is. It's steadfast. Our hope Uh, of you our hope in what is going to happen in your life is steadfast because god is going to work and that's what our hope is with our kids isn't it when they've walked away from the things of the lord our hope isn't in what what they look like right now our hope is that god is going to grab a hold of them and move them and change them and save them and that hope shouldn't change no matter how old they get or how far away they go Because God is still able to get them. If he can save you and me, he can save our kids. And he can grab a hold of them. And for our kids' kids. My brother is so upset with the world 
they had one child and they stopped because they didn't want to bring any more kids into the world. And it's so sad. You missed a lifetime of rejoicing with kids because you looked at situations in the world instead of who God is. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say cut down on the number of kids you had. (laughs) And they were in hard times. But he said, be fruitful and multiply. Go, I'll take care of them. And who do we entrust our kids to? Is it how we've raised them? Or is it in who our God is that can take care of them and save them? Because you were all a mess, but now you're a sanctified mess. And God is good. And your parents prayed for you. Your grandparents prayed for you. I remember one kid <laughs> at one of the churches I was at, I was, uh, I had the back doors open because it was real hot in the church. And so I had the back doors open just to get some fresh air in. And I was working around the church, and I came back into the sanctuary. And uh, at that time, one of uh, a, a famous singer who still lives in Rochester uh, had been coming to church, and he left one of his microphones there at church. Uh, and uh, a kid came through the back door, and he grabbed that microphone. And the microphone was probably thousands of dollars, just the microphone. Uh, and he ran out the door with it, and I saw him, and I yelled at him, and I ran after him. I could still run, and I ran after him, got to the door, and I realized I can't catch this kid. <laughs> so I just yelled out, and I said, I bet you you've got a grandma that's praying for you, and you better stop. And he brought the microphone back because he did have a grandma that was praying for him. You don't know the effect that you have, but we know the God that has an effect on people's hearts and lives. He can stop them when they don't know anything about them. He can stop them when they're on a course that's wrong, and yet they believe it sincerely to be right. He can intervene and interrupt anytime, anywhere. Do you trust him that much that he can do that? Is your hope in him steadfast, like Paul's hope of the church at Corinth is steadfast, knowing that as you're partakers of the sufferings, so shall also you be partakers of that consolation, (laughs) that consolation that only God can bring, consolation in time of trouble. Sometimes we lose that horizontal or that vertical view because we're looking so much at the horizontal. We've got to keep that vertical view so straight in our lives that the horizontal always looks good because God is in the midst and God is taking care of it. And he says in verse 8, For we would not, brethren, uh, have you ignorant of our trouble. And we know some of those ignorant times. In Thessalonians, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about the rapture. He tells us in other places about that ignorance that he doesn't want us to have. But he says here, I I don't know. I, I don't want you to be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were in trouble. And he wasn't telling them he was in trouble just so that they would feel sorry for him. He wanted to tell them that they were in trouble because and God took care of them in it to be encouraged. The church at Corinth is in trouble, and yet he is, has a hope that's steadfast that says, I know God is going to get you through this, and God is going to bring the church and make it look without blemish and without spot and look beautiful. And we look at ourselves and go, Lord, I'm a mess. And he goes, I know. But you're a sanctified mess, and I'm going to make you beautiful. Oh, and we just need to be willing to let him work. Lord, help me to stop me in the midst of this and let you work. I don't want you to be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure, <laughs> uh, above strength in so much we despaired even of life. The Apostle Paul despaired that he might not even make it through. Yeah. Amazing. Have you ever been there that you don't think you can go one more inch? You can do one more thing. You can take one more problem. But God, who is rich in mercy, can get you through that. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In Jeremiah uh, 17, uh, verses 5 to 7, it says this, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. And and, and as you look at these words, uh, 
he says that, that a man that trusteth in, in another man, trusteth in the ways of man, trusteth in the things of man, trusteth in the politics of man, and maketh that flesh, that man, he, his strength, his heart is departed from the Lord. Oh. And here's Jeremiah, who we read about, who we never read about having one convert, and yet was faithful to just keep going. And we give up because nobody wants to listen to us. And the Lord says, keep going. And he says in verse 6, For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and the salt land not inhabited. It's amazing. The the Lord even shows him. uh, He says, you're going to be like this animal in the desert, and you're not even going to see when good comes. You can be in desert places, in dry places, and still see good coming because God is good and God is always with us. He says, you can be so dry, but if your your trust is in what man is doing, then you're not going to see the goodness of God coming to you. Oh, and that's a sad place to be. So not only are you dry physically, but you're dry spiritually. And you can't see good coming. And Lord, help us to see good coming no matter what. Because even in all the mess that the world is in and all the trouble that Israel is having, in all the trouble with sex trafficking, in all the kids that are getting hurt and murdered and killed and and, uh, beaten up and raped and everything else, God is still good. And God is still on the throne. And God is still going to take care of us. That's where our focus is, not in how dry things are and how bad things are, but how good God is. Because if we get in that place, we're not going to see good coming. And good is coming. He's coming for the church. And in verse 7, he finishes up and he says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. (laughs) Oh, how happy is that man that trusts in the Lord. Even in the dry times, even in the desert times, even in the hurtful times, you trust in God. And let's help each other to do that because we can despair. We can get depressed. We can get discouraged. We can look at the world and just throw our hands up and say, forget it. It's not worth it. But it is worth it because somebody needs Jesus. And we may not even see good coming. Hmm. So in verse 9 there, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul says, I'm in that place just like Jeremiah was talking about. I I was in that place, and it says that we should not even trust in ourselves. But what do we trust in? We trust in God who raises the dead. If he can raise the dead, he can raise our spirits. He can raise us to a higher plane. And God always wants to raise you up. He never wants you to lay in despair and despondency. He always wants to raise you up above that. And we've got a lot to be despondent about. We've got diseases. We've got death. We've got injury. We've got cancers. We've got kids that are prodigals. We've got churches that are falling apart. We've got church leaders that are falling into sin. But we've got God who's still on the throne. And Paul, just like Jeremiah, says, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord whose hope is in God. Where's your hope tonight? It certainly isn't in our politics. It's in our God because he can raise the dead. And if he can raise the dead, he can raise us. And it says, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver the three places of salvation from our past, our present, and our future. The three stages of salvation. He's delivered us. He does deliver us even now, and he will yet deliver us. (laughs) The three phases of that salvation that we have. He also helping together by prayer for us. So even though the church at Corinth couldn't do much, they could pray. You feel like you can't do much for God? You can pray. Keep praying. You also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given on by many on our behalf for our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom (laughs) as he puts that in there get rid of the flesh get rid of the flesh get rid of the flesh become spiritual beings be those new creations that god is making and it's by the grace of god remember when we started out grace and peace here's the grace again 
as Paul says, I know this grace, I see this grace, and I want to use this grace in the situation that's going on before me right now. I don't want to rail on the church because they're being bozos. I want to show grace to them that they might show grace to each other. We have had our conversation in the world. We've had our lifestyle and more abundantly to you, word. For we we write none other things unto you than what we read or acknowledge, and I trust that you shall acknowledge even to the end, as also you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. (laughs) And that in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. I wanted to come to you again, that I wanted to bring a further blessing of my ministry to you. It's not that he was bringing a second blessing of the Holy Spirit or anything like that. He just wanted to bring a blessing uh, of his ministry being right in the midst of where they were. And he said, I wanted to pass by you into Macedonia and to come uh, again out of Macedonia unto you and of you uh, to be brought... uh, on my way towards Judea. Remember, he is bringing the collection to to Jerusalem. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness, rhetorical questions, as he brings to them here in this verse, or, or did I purpose, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea and nay and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. It wasn't given flippantly. It wasn't giving wrongly. It was giving because these are the things that I wanted. Because there was some in the church that were saying, Paul's never going to come back to you again. He doesn't care about you people. (laughs) And boy, we look at that with a man as the church looks to a man like that. And we think, could I think that towards God? That's, I think, why the Lord tells us that he hasn't left us as orphans that he sent us his Holy Spirit to indwell us, to keep us, to show us that he hasn't left us as orphans. He hasn't left us alone on our own. And that's where many in the church are thinking. God set up the world, gave a way of salvation, and now he has nothing to do with the world and he doesn't care. Just like, really? How can you read your scriptures and think that God does not care about you? And yet many in the church are just saying, God has taken his hand off, he doesn't care. God may have taken his hand off of America because of the sin of the nation, but he cares about you as individuals who love Jesus Christ, and he cares about you, and he's working in your life. The nation may fall, but he is still going to be with you. And praise the Lord for it, that you can be a light even when the rest of the nation falters. Because we've got a hope that goes beyond our nation. You know, in heaven, there isn't going to be the United States of heaven. (laughs) It ain't going to be there. It's heaven. It's where God is. It's what he's made. And he surrounded himself with the church. And it's not a new America. It's heaven. America's great, but it's not as great as heaven. Trust him. Hmm. He says in verse 19, uh, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. All the promises of God are yea and amen. Hold on to him. (laughs) Trust him. Because why? Under the glory of God by us. As you hold on to him, it gives God glory. God, you said you'd never leave me or forsake me. You know what that does? It gives glory to the Lord. And we think, I can't do anything for the Lord. You've just given the Lord glory by hanging on to that promise. And the Lord is going to bless in the midst of that. It says in verse 21, Now he which establish, establisheth us with you in Christ has anointed us is God. It's God that does it. It's God who's with it. And he has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The down payment is the meaning of that word. He's given us the down payment. He sealed us. He, he knows who are his We've been sealed. We we don't see the seal, (laughs) but the seal is the Holy Spirit that's in us. And he says, do you trust that? Oh, Lord, do I trust that you dwell in me? Mm. And we show it by our lives. We show it by our actions. We show it by our words. We show it by what we love and what we say. 
the words that we use, the thoughts that we think, we show it in those things. He says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, in that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. I haven't come there yet. Not for that we have dominion over you over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy. We're here to help. Paul doesn't say I lord it over you and I've got this pointed hat on my head and you respect me for who I am. He says, I'm a helper in your joy. I'm just here as a helper. And that's what ministers are. Ministers are just servants. That's what the word means, servants. It doesn't mean they have a super title over everybody else. It means they're the servant of all. We're here to be helpers in your joy, servants for you. For what? For by faith you stand. How do you stand today? Are you standing by faith that Jesus is still who he says he is? Or are you standing in your own strength saying, I've I've made myself this Christian that I am? Mm. Because we we can't make ourselves anything. It's God that makes us. He's made us these new creations in Christ. Not us redoing ourselves. Him making us brand new. You've got a new direction. You've got a new hope. You've got a new future, you've got new everything, and you've got the Holy Spirit in you. Lord, help us to then stand in this world. Remember in Ephesians chapter 6, he he tells them about the armor, all the pieces of the armor and what to do with it. And he says, and when you've done all, stand, just stand. We have enough trouble just standing, don't we? (laughs) Much less doing anything. Lord, some days I can't even stand. He says, I'll give you the strength for it because I'm your hope. I'm your trust. I'm who you are. I'm your all in all. And so, Father, we just thank you so much for this chapter of comfort, this chapter of hope, Lord, and this encouragement uh, that Paul was giving to the church at Corinth. It certainly is an, an encouragement for our church, Lord, for our body, for us as believers in who you are. Uh, Lord, you, you use these words to encourage us to stand to stay straight, to persevere, to be steadfast in hope. And, Father, it's all the things that we need because these times have brought a hopelessness to the world, a hopelessness of what can we do. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Lord, help us with these things, not to be defeated ones, but to be the victorious ones because you're our victory. You're the one that's won the victory. You've defeated death and hell. You are the one that has brought us to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so we just stand in who you are, Lord. We stand in grace, in mercy, in faith, in trust of who you are. Help us with it, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.